So uh, today's video is a little bit of advice uh, for choosing your A-level subject combinations. Uh, it's getting to that time of year where you might have to start thinking about it if you're going into the sixth form or maybe uh, you're, you've never studied it before and you want to know what you should choose. So here are some things that you might want to think about when you're making those sorts of decisions. So the first thing is, uh, whatever you do, don't make decisions based off of how you've performed in each subject up until now. So uh, you might have some GCSE results, or if you're an international student, maybe you've got some middle school results, and you might look at each subject and see that you've maybe not done as well as you thought in a certain subject. Don't let that make your decision of what to study at A-level. There's really not much correlation between how you perform at uh, GCSE level um, in a subject and then A-level and onwards because the style of examination is so different. The subject con uh, content will be new and it's basically starting from the ground up. So um, uh, if you make a decision based off of GCSE, you might lock yourself into one path. So um, humanities or sciences, you know, just because of one single paper. So I would definitely look at each subject that you could take with fresh eyes and don't put yourself in a sort of I'm bad at this or I'm good at this only uh, type of thing. I've seen so many students succeed after not having had the best results at GCSE middle school level so don't let that uh, deter you. Uh, the second thing that you've got to do is make sure you understand um, the difference between uh, facilitating and non-facilitating subjects. So this used to be a list that the Russell Group universities used to post um, specifically outlining which subjects a student should choose for particular courses. They don't actually do that anymore. Instead, what they have is more of this kind of interactive site. Uh, it's called informedchoices.ac.uk if you want to click onto it. And it kind of gives you a bit of advice about what each subject might be useful for and what universities look at. However, I still think there is a quite a strong leaning towards these facilitating subjects uh, versus non-facilitating. So what it means is facilitating subjects are subjects which are required to enter certain courses. So a lot of courses such as medicine will require chemistry and biology, engineering courses might require further maths, physics courses, physics, and so on and so forth. So the list of facilitating subjects, which you can find if you do a quick Google, but it's going to be basically maths, the three sciences, um, and uh, maybe geography, history, because you can't study these subjects without, uh, you can't go on to degree level without these A-level subjects. Uh, also, modern languages often the case as well. So these are, that's, that's what it really means. Um, so just make sure if you have some idea of what you want to study, you can't, you don't want to cut yourself off from those options. So to avoid that, you have to, you, you've just got to make sure that you're studying at least the, a couple of, or maybe the right combination of facilitating subjects, um, because the rest of it doesn't really matter. The third point is um, a little bit different from facilitating versus non-facilitating subjects is hard versus soft subjects. So again, um, we officially, the universities don't now kind of differentiate too much between these subjects because it was um, actually stopping a lot of students from studying um, soft subjects and as a result the universities weren't getting as much interest in those particular degrees. But as I said, again, I still think there's an element of kind of favouritism towards the hard subjects. Um, so hard subjects, again you can find lists, but hard subjects uh, and soft subjects, the way they differ is kind of um, in um, whether they are more um, based in kind of academic a sort of academic approach versus a bit more like practical focus. So if we take something, a really good example is economics versus business studies or business, whatever, depending on the curriculum. But um, something like economics, when you go to university, a lot of the theories and thing, concepts you learn in economics, they set you up very well to study further at university because they're testing sort of your, they're, they're, they're building your um, an analytical and evaluatory skills and and, you know, a lot of the concepts you learn are really useful because they go on to university learning, but they're not a direct imitation of degree level economics. It's, it's still very kind of different. It's just more like the underlying kind of meanings. Whereas with business, um, if you look at the exam paper, which I know they've kind of changed recently, so it's less so now, but it's a lot more based on kind of memorization of, you know, um, 
uh, marketing mixes or you know you could get away with doing the exam just by memorizing a textbook whereas you've got to kind of apply those ideas more in econ um, and then furthermore business um, at a university level is a lot more academic than just um, memorizing you know what the five p's are and stuff so i think it's got less um, slightly less uh, kind of good skill building for students who want to go to university. That's not to say it's not useful. At the end of the day, it's what the student gets out of the subject. So if you, you know, if you just barely pass econ versus really getting into business and letting it find, you know, take you on to reading, I don't know, Porter's competitive advantage or finding um, kind of higher level readings and stuff, then obviously that's going to be far more valuable and you can reflect that in your personal statement or in your teacher's reference or, or in competitions and essays. So there's definitely value in that. But just on a basic level, I would choose economics over business studies uh, if you're going to put the same amount of effort in. So again, list of soft subjects you can find <clears throat> on various websites. Um, if you are not sure kind of what is considered hard or soft, then what I would suggest is actually looking at um, kind of private school uh, curriculum. So basically the schools that tend to send a lot of kids to Russell Group unis, um, if you look at the subjects that they offer, that's usually a fairly good indication of what subjects are valued by universities. Obviously these schools, they kind of specialize in sending kids to the top universities. So you can, you can kind of guess from that. And what you'll notice is that, you know, if you look at those who rank quite highly in secondary schools, they don't offer any of the, you know, softer subjects. It's gonna be the core, kind of facilitating subjects alongside you know all the modern languages and then kind of music art and these more specific things that you need for certain degree courses but no, no business you know no media studies no kind of textiles nothing like this so um, that's usually a fairly good indication unfortunately we can we have to kind of defer to people who've really done their research in this area if you uh, you know purely if only if universities you're you know kind of true and only goal. So obviously there's so much value in every single subject that you can study, but this is specifically if you're aiming for sort of Russell Group Uni. Um, the next point I would make is uh, if you're kind of trying to decide how to combine subjects and you know what to do, think about what universities are looking for. The, what they're looking for is a wide range of skills that you have gained. So that would be analytical skills, problem solving skills, ability to kind of interpret data, um, ability to uh, quick critically evaluate an argument, write essays, you know, reference articles properly and things like this. So um, to show a wide range of skills, once you've kind of found the subject ranges that you uh, need, I would recommend taking a combination, unless you're going for something like pure science, pure um, engineering, something like that, very STEM based, then of course you don't need a humanities subject. But if you're kind of in the middle, then take a combination, take a um, problem solving subject like a math or a science combined with a uh, humanity subject such as geography or history and then maybe finish it off with a modern language which obviously has different skills as well that shows you as a real all-rounder so that's actually much more valuable than just just because you're going for like let's say PPE to study you know econ politics philosophy that combination I would say is actually weaker than doing something like maths uh, politics and biology because that shows better range or maths uh, politics and French, you know, that again, it shows um, different skills that you've had to learn to get those grades or in those subjects. So I would definitely do a combination. My next tip is um, to study maths A-level. Um, just, I think it should just, regardless of what subject you're going for, um, maths A-level is uh, always, always useful. A lot of subjects, uh, degrees actually kind of require maths. It is the most commonly required subject. I think this, the exam itself is, um, is really is really doable. If you just put the work in, it's one of those things where just start from the beginning, don't fall behind, you know, don't feel panicked, just build up those skills one by one. And maths, I think, is is you can definitely score a good enough grade in that for it to be a useful addition to your application. And it is just such a it's such a nice little tick in a university's book to see, okay, they've got maths, they've got some core kind of skills of problem solving and um, stats and um, a bit of uh, kind of you know, that kind of with numbers you're comfortable with those because every single subject has some knowledge of how to deal with those things. And I think it's a lot less scary if you approach it from A-level, build up those skills really slowly but surely, rather than being chucked into it at a university where you might panic because there is nobody to kind of guide you along there um, and you will still have to learn some sort of steps. So I would definitely say take maths. 
Um, the last thing that I would recommend that you do is um, take a look at, so it's all well and good to kind of choose your subjects based on what you're going to study, but at the end of the day, it's really important that you achieve your grades or achieve the grades that your offer you know, gives you um, in your conditional offer. So, um, you know, you can look at sort of university, uh, uh, you know, oh, sorry, you can look at A-level results here. They're all available by, um, the government releases them um, across the country. So if you look here, something like A-level maths, um, in 2019, we've got 16.3% A-star achievement, and then a further sort of like 20 something percentage getting an A grade. So about 60% of all test takers received a B or above. So, you know, it's, it's um, it, that's a pretty good rate, I would say. And then here's uh, the A-level subjects, kind of um, the whole list of what people took. And if you look at how many people take each subject range, you can see that, you know, the most popular it's obviously going to be mathematics, 85,000 people um, chose to take that, or is that? Yeah, 85,000. And then, you know, you've got kind of the less popular subjects, uh, kind of like, um, uh, you know, modern language, seven, Spanish, 7,900. 7, However, if you look at A star, A achievement, 35%, that's really good. Um, so looking at this, you can kind of decide, okay, how likely am I to achieve the A or A star if you are looking at most Russell Group offers, I would say, then um, something like physics, you know, it's 27.5%, it's actually higher than you might think, you know, same with chemistry, 30, almost 30%, you know, so that's quite promising, whereas um, biology, which is actually, um, I would say, in exam-wise, people tend to think it's um, kind of more durable than chemistry, actually is much lower, 23% only, so um, that tells you a little bit about um, kind of how people actually achieve uh, their grades at the end of the day. Um, compare business studies here, only 14% received A star A versus Econ, which is actually 30%. So, you know, it's not a perfect system, but um, obviously some of it is self-selecting. Look at this further maths, 53% A star A. That is obviously because a lot of students who, the students who take further math have also, have already kind of self-selected themselves as being good at maths. Nobody who's not, you know, kind of got some skill in maths is going to take further maths. And so that's why that's going to be so high. So obviously you have to understand that there's a lot of self-selection here as well. So it's not perfect, but taking that with a pinch of salt, if you, if you feel like you can put the work in, then I would, I would uh, use this as a pretty good uh, estimator of uh, what you're likely or what you might achieve. So you would, you would know, am I in the top 20%? Am I in the top 10% of my class or whatever, then if you are, then you might, you're probably likely to get one of these uh, grades here. Hopefully that will give you a good idea of where to start. And uh, yeah, I hope that was helpful. Thanks.